Well, everybody, why don't we start with a prayer and then we'll go into our teaching today. Father, in Jesus' name, we are excited to hear what you have to say through the Holy Spirit. Lord God, our topic today, which is knowing the Lord Jesus Christ, what a broad topic. <laughs> he is the eternal life, and we want to know him with our whole heart. You want us to know him with our whole heart. So we're here today, gathered before the Lord, in the name of Jesus, under the teaching of the Holy Spirit, for you to instruct us. Give us understanding and revelation. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, everybody, you've got the teaching that we're about ready to review in front of you here. And as I was saying in the prayer, this is entitled, To Know Jesus, Who Really Is He? And you know, that might sound cliche, who really is Jesus? Well, I know who Jesus is. You know, everybody knows who Jesus is. He's the Son of God. And he came to the world to save mankind. And uh, we could go on with a short list of different things that we all think that Jesus is. But you know, what we need to discipline ourselves toward is not just who we think he is, who we've heard he is, but what does the Scripture declare him to be? Who does the Scripture declare him to be? And, you know, you'll find some surprises in Scripture when you start finding out that Jesus, I mean, is something much bigger, much broader than we thought he was. In fact, really the whole Bible is written in some form, in some way, about who he is. His coming, prophesying about him, what he was going to do, who he was going to be, and why. Today, we're just going to go into a little fraction of that for a few minutes, and I think that by the time we're done, you'll be encouraged by these scriptures that we're reviewing. The way that I formatted this is we're going to look at it sentence by sentence, and we're going into the book of First John, and we're going into the translation that I trust the most for study, and that is the Young's Literal Translation. We have a split room here. We've got experienced Bible learners, and we've also got younger Bible learners. For the experienced ones, I think you'll appreciate what I'm doing. The younger ones might think, you know, what is that weird translation? Well, let me explain it to you this way. This translation is based on a man, his last name was Young, and he was a Greek and Hebrew scholar, world-renowned, and what he did was he wrote the Young's uh, Concordance, which is like the Strong's Concordance, and what he also did was he wrote a translation of the Bible called the Young's Literal Translation. What's so great about it is that it gives you, right from the Greek language in the New Testament, what the words mean. So the way that it lays out in a sentence is a little choppy sometimes, but you're actually getting the words that were being spoken. Instead of like what we think they might have been, this is what they were. So I can really trust it and I can really teach from it, and I think you'll find it enlightening in some areas of um, 1 John here, maybe in a way that you hadn't heard before. So let's dive in. We're starting off with the book of 1 John, starting with verse 1. 1 John 1. It says this, and I'm going to, by the way, read through the whole of the, let's see, it's 10 sentences, essentially, and then we're going to go back and review it. So here we go. That which was from the beginning, that which we have heard, that which we have seen with our eyes, that which we did behold and our hands did handle concerning the word of life. And the life was manifested, and we have seen and do testify and declare to you the life, the age during, which means the eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us. Verse 3, that which we have seen and heard declare we to you, that you also may have fellowship with us, and our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you, that your joy may be full. And this is the message that we have heard from him and announced to you, that God is light and darkness in him is not at all. If we may say we have fellowship with him and in the darkness we may walk, we lie and do not the truth. And if in the light we may walk, as since he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ his Son doth cleanse us from every sin. If we may say we have not sinned, ourselves we lead astray, and the truth is not in us. 
verse 9, if we may confess our sins, steadfast he is and righteous that he may forgive us the sins and may cleanse us from every unrighteousness. If we may say we have not sinned, a liar we make him and his word is not in us. Okay, as you scan through these first 10 sentences, the thing that happens to me as an experienced Bible reader, and I've read this many, many times in my life, uh, I go like, yeah, 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 yeah. That It's all great. Yep, I remember hearing that. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Yep, that's good. Good Bible doctrine. That's why we need to break it down and look at it sentence by sentence. I think by the time we're done looking at the sentences, you'll go like, yeah, I didn't notice that. So here we go with verse 1. It says, that which was from the beginning, that which we have heard, that which we have seen with our eyes, that which we did behold and our hands did handle, concerning the word of life, or of the life, the word of the life. Let's look at this first. The way that John's talking here is very unusual. You notice he's not mentioning the name Jesus at all. He's calling it that which we have, that which we have heard, that which we have seen with our eyes. Almost like this is bigger than a person we're talking about. We're talking about a something. This something is what it was before it came to the earth. And I don't mean to say it like in some weird way. I'm saying keep a name off of it for now. What he's saying really, and the sentence ends this way, is that this thing, if you will, was the word of the life. That's what we were talking about, the word of the life. And that's why he's talking like, this is the way he'd say it, that which was from the beginning, which we've heard. I mean, we've seen it with our eyes. We actually looked at it, and our hands handled the word of the life. See what I mean? He's just beside himself. It's like John the Baptist when he said, do you know, I'm not even worthy to stoop down and unlatch his sandals. That's who this is that's standing before you. This is the one that all things were made through, and he's standing here on the earth right in front of you. That's Jesus. And so I made a couple of notes about verse 1. First, this one John speaks of was from the beginning. That's who we're dealing with, the person who was here when everything was made. Second, they actually heard him speak. See, John is one of the witnesses that was what the apostles were, by the way. I don't know if you realize that. They, they had a, a job responsibility to go out and tell people, but what they were really doing is they were telling them based on the fact they were witnesses to what had occurred. They saw Jesus from the very beginning of his ministry, heard every word he spoke until the time he was raised up from the earth and went back to heaven. So what he's saying here, he literally heard these things from Jesus. Next, they saw him who was from the beginning with their own eyes. Do do you see, I think we've gotten a little too comfortable with Jesus. I mean, do you hear the tone that John speaks in? He's going like, I mean, we actually saw him. The, The highest level, and I've said this before, of political, you know, job title in America would be the presidency. So no matter what your political bend would be, If the president of the United States was pulling past in his limousine with his, I mean, entourage of probably 15 vehicles surrounding him and police escort on right and left side and and probably, you know, FBI over there and FBI over there. And it's, it's extremely impressive, you know. And so you'd say maybe that day when you got back to work or got back home, you'd say, I actually saw the president as he went by. Do you see that? Because there's an awe about that. Well, that's just a man. This John's talking about, we actually touched the word of the life. We actually were in the presence of the person who came from heaven and all things were created through. So do you see, that's how he's talking to us here. And then I think it's something we need to start to get a handle on He is called the Word of Life. In fact, it says in the book of Revelation that on his thigh is written the Word of God. Isn't that interesting? 
I mean, that's who he is. He is the Word of God. Now, his human name is Jesus. Actually, I say his human name is Yeshua. That, that would really be more of the Hebrew pronunciation. The Jesus is called a transliteration of the word. So really, they wouldn't have called him Jesus. In fact, Jesus came from the word Aesis. Aesis. This is all true. This is not propaganda. Aesis. And then they made it more Americanized, if you will, to call him Jesus. But really, his Hebrew name would have been Yeshua. And so that's still just a, a, a human name. That was placed upon him. Really, who he is, is the word of Almighty God. That's who he was called at the beginning. If you could hold your thoughts just till the end. At the very beginning and at the very end of time, we hear the word of God. Okay? So that's what he's identifying here. He's the word of the life. Remember, by the way, too, John is the writer of the book of John, too. This is this is later. John was one of the four Gospels. Everybody refers to the book of John as the first book to read about Jesus. Well, we're hearing more about him through 1 John from the same writer. All right, let's move on to verse 2. And the life was manifested. Not Jesus was manifested. The life was manifested. That means the life suddenly came out where we could see it. I mean, the life was a spirit Jesus, who we call Jesus today, he was a spirit. Now he suddenly comes into the earth and he's manifested. And he is identified as the life. That's who you're dealing with. When you're speaking in the name of Jesus, you're speaking in the name of the life, which is amazing. So the life was manifested. We've seen and do testify and declare to you the life. Such a weird Greek thing. It's called the age during. You know, the age meaning the age forever. Do you see what I mean? And it's during the age. So it's like what that's saying, that's the word eternal life. It's saying that we're slicing in on time and yet it's part of eternity. Well, he is called the life. He is the eternal life, and he's timeless. So this being, if you will, this being who we were created through went from spirit form called the word of life from another place called heaven and was manifested in the earth, the one that the earth was made through, and he came here. That's what John's saying. And it says that this one called the life was with the Father, and he was manifested to us. So it's important to realize he was with, he was not the. He was with the Father. He's not the Father. Don't call him the Father. That's not who he is. Don't pray and say, Father, Jesus, Father. (laughs) You know what I mean? I mean, he's not going to get offended, but I'm saying it'd be like me calling Ann Lisa, Ann's Ann. Jesus is Jesus, Father is Father. But we haven't even gotten to Jesus yet. Do you notice that? His name hasn't even been identified yet. We're talking about the life, the word of life, the one who was eternal life. And then just a couple notes on verse 2. It says, John calls this one the life. The life appeared on earth. What's that all about? The life appeared on earth. What do you mean the life? I mean, life is just what's in everything, right? Yeah, it is. What's that tell you? Apparently, in some way, who we call Jesus, the life, is in all mankind, all of the earth, everything. In other words, the life is what keeps everything alive, right? That's who we're dealing with. We're dealing with as much of a an it, I guess I could say, as it is a him. Do you see what I mean? He is the life. I mean, it's such a high idea that we can't really grasp that. And that's what John's trying to do. He's trying to put it into the human words. That's who was standing there. That's who we're reading about in the books of, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. All right? This one was the eternal life. Now, the Greek for that, we learned this last week. And by the way, what we've been doing, just to kind of tie last week to this week, is we're going through to know, to know God. 
That is eternal life, to know him. So last week we learned the word eternal life, which is Ionesis, and no beginning or end of absolute fullness of life. That's who this person is. He is absolute fullness of life. Would you imagine then it makes sense for you when someone says, you are so narrow-minded. I mean, you believe that like Jesus is it? Just get off that and go back to Jesus, as the scripture declares, is the life. He is absolute life. You don't want anything else other than absolute life. So I'm directing you to the absolute life. You're so narrow-minded. Okay, I guess this isn't for you. But the person that can hear what you're saying would go like, oh yeah, I want absolute life. Well, that's who this person is. It's, It's located in a person. It's interesting that it's a person. We, we all grew up probably in the time of Star Wars and, and that sort of a, a movie and the idea of the force that's talked about on Star Wars. You know, we get that concept at least that there's a force of life that's out there in the universe. Well, the reality is Jesus is not a force. He's a person. So it's interesting that all of that is located in a person. So if I was standing in front of Rob, for example, and he actually was, you know, Yeshua, It would be, like what John's saying, an amazing experience. There he is. I mean, when John, later in the book of Revelation, had Jesus appear to him, this same John who had walked with him on the earth, hugged him, loved him, kissed him, fell down at his feet like he was dead. That's what Jesus is like now. So much power. It says that everything of God proceeds through him. Everything is sustained by the word of his power at this moment. When we call him the king, that's a major understatement. The word king is a human invention. That word is an idea that we came up with. Jesus, and and God tolerates that definition. But the idea is, he is, when we say sovereign, I mean, he is, when we say Lord, the thing that sustains all things. All things are made. If it wasn't for him, our, our cells would fall apart right now. I, I would disintegrate. I'd, I'd be black dust on the ground. You see what I mean? That's who we're talking about here. All right. Verse 3. That which we have seen and heard. We're getting firsthand witness speaking about this. John is telling us what he experienced. That which we have seen and heard declare we to you that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. So let's look at a few ideas on that scripture. John's purpose for writing these things is to describe what they had seen and heard. It's pretty straightforward, in a sense. We saw the word of life. We heard the word of life. This is what he said. This is what he did when he was here. Do you see what I'm saying? So... We can trust this document as from a first-hand witness. And by the way, the reason that there was also Matthew, Mark, and Luke written is it's like going to a courtroom and having witnesses appear. We don't have one witness. We don't have two. We don't have three. We've got four documents written about the same events. That's why they have that in the Scripture. And then also, there weren't just four people that were writing about this. There were actually 12 apostles that were all testifying to the same thing. And by the way, just for the record, all 12 apostles, except for John, John had kind of a unique ending, but even he was martyred in a sense, but all 12 died for what they were professing. You know, so if you're wondering, maybe these guys all got together and they were just kind of whipping up a new religion and trying to make this thing make sense. So they, they corroborated their evidence and their witness was all timed with each other and stuff like that. Dude, that all makes sense. That's fine if all you're doing is making up a religion. But when they are threatening your life every single day, they beat you, stone you, whip you, take your family on you, um, your image and reputation is destroyed and decimated in your society. You're cast out of the synagogues and out of the temple. The high priest hates you and declares you to be an evil person. I mean, hey, man, you know, so much for making up a new religion. I think I'm going to forget that and go back to the Israeli society. Lies. 
So the point is, is that these people were committed because this is the truth. That's what you can take from that, that there were all these witnesses. All these witnesses were seeing the same thing and declaring the same thing. Okay. Another thing about verse 3 is everyone would have fellowship with the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. That's the intent of God. This is not supposed to be an exclusive club. He's called mankind to have what He calls fellowship. You know, sometimes we'll go to our churches and we'll call it a fellowship, or we'll have fellowship in church, or we'll have fellowship with one another. That's one level. And then there's fellowship with the Creator. And that's what we've all been called to, to have fellowship with the Creator. Today, all I want you to go away on that point with is, I wonder what that's all about. That's I'm interested in that. Fellowshipping with my Creator, because he's saying to fellowship with him is eternal life. And then the last point on verse 3 is, we now know the one being described is Jesus Christ, because the end of verse 3 says, and with his son, Jesus Christ. Up until verse 3, there was never even a declaration of who we're talking about because it was bigger than a name. The name is just what he was given on the earth. He was not, you know, some people will say, well, he was Jesus, he's always been Jesus. Well, the person we're talking about was always there. But I mean, Jesus is a uniquely, you know, human thing. He became Jesus when he was born into this earth. He was the Almighty. I mean, he was the Word of life that became a human being. So I wouldn't get stuck on the fact that, you know, he was always the Son of God. Now, don't get me wrong. Listen very carefully, because this could sound blasphemous, but I want to stir you up a little bit. Was he always the Son of God? You know, yeah, come on over here, Jesus. Let's let's play a little baseball with each other. Can you just hold your your thought for a minute? I think I'll, I'll define it, but just for the recording's sake. But what we're doing, not at all, no no problem. But what we're doing is we're looking at this like a human father and a son working together, you know, playing together, uh, going out and hitting some baseball together. But the idea is not exactly that before he became the human being that he was. When he became human, born into the earth, born of Mary, that's when he became Jesus the Christ. Before that, he was the word of God. There was God the Father, God the Word, and God the Holy Spirit. Well, but he was his son. The Bible doesn't say he was his son. The Bible says he was the Word of God. All things were created through this person. He became the son on the earth in the sense that he's the firstborn. That's a human idea. It was like the Jewish idea that God established through Adam and Eve the idea that the firstborn was the one that the inheritance would come through and it was going to take a human being to save mankind because a human being damned mankind. So who Jesus is today, when we call him the eternal son of God, you know, in the mind of the father, the father always knew Jesus, always has known Jesus being the human form of God, but he really wasn't the eternal son of God. Are you understanding what I'm saying? He was the word of God forever. That To me, that's higher. Do you see what I mean? That, but really, we need to understand that amazingly, what happened in Jesus, the human Jesus, God and man were fused. That's the covenant. God took on human DNA, became one with us and our, our creation, and you know, he still is in a human body. When you meet him someday physically, he's still going to be Jesus, the man, Jesus Christ. That's amazing. I mean, to me, that's a real step down. He did that for us. So we'll understand more in the future. But the point is, does that stir you up a little bit? I'm not trying to to throw you off, but I'm saying we get a, a, a real religious idea. That makes a lot more sense to me, that he was the word of God that became a human being. He wasn't, look, he wasn't always a human being. You think there was a human being in the Godhead before the creation of the earth? There's a human being in the Godhead now. He's a human. And he still is a human. He was a human. He still is a human. And he's going to be a human in the future. Just like like us. Do you see what I'm saying? All right. Verse 4. 
And these things we write to you, that your joy may be full. Now we're getting to some meat and potatoes here. The purpose that God has in mind for us to fellowship with him, to know him through the Lord Jesus Christ, is that our joy may be full. Now we're used to that phrase, that can become a a really overused phrase, joy full. Full joy. Joy may be full. What a nice idea. How about this? If you're talking about your joy being full, think about a cup and start filling it with water. Okay, if it was half full, that'd be half full. What would be the average person, if you wanted to use that cup of water analogy to compare, uh, the average person would probably be like uh, an 80th of the cup full of water. One 80th of that, you know, little teeny level of water at the very bottom of the cup. That's the joy, okay? That's the joy level that mankind has. We need to go back and read what the scripture says. I write these things to you that your joy may be full. You would have full joy. You couldn't put any more joy in you. You're full up with it. Total joy. Total joy. That's what we're supposed to have in our fellowship with God. And it only comes through our fellowship with God. We can't get that from any other means. So when you look at the word full joy, remember, it comes from knowing the Father and Jesus Christ. And when you do that, it will give us full joy. So that's all found in him. Now, I think that what I really need is a trip to the Bahamas. <laughs> I, I, I want to go, go fishing in Alaska. That's what I've been looking for, man. Now, it's not that that wouldn't be enjoyable, but I'm saying if you're looking for full joy... You can save yourself a trip. The full joy is found in our fellowship with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. Right? All right. Let's go on. It says this, verse 5, and this is the message. This is the message that we've heard from him. This This should kind of surprise you guys a little bit. The message. I wonder what the message is that they heard from Jesus Christ, the word of life. The message was this, and we announce it to you. God is light, and darkness in him is not at all. God is light. That was the message that Jesus was declaring when he was preaching in the earth. He would have said that in one form or another, over and over again, God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. Now, if we're honest, the first thought that would come to our mind, if we really were thinking through this a little bit, is well, good for him. (laughs) You know what I mean? Good for him. He's light. I'm obviously not. So he must be having a good day. I'm sure not. But the reality is he's not declaring that so that you feel bad. He's declaring that so that you see, I am light and I want you to be light along with me. And light is such a fascinating word. One picture of light that I really enjoy, and it's a simple demonstration, which we don't even have to do. You'll picture it as I describe this. But you walk into, you know, your dark bedroom. Let's say that your curtains are closed. It's it's nighttime, 9 o'clock at night. Walk in, I mean, it's pitch dark. But you reach around the corner of that door, flip the light switch up and on, and all of a sudden, bam, the light's on. And I mean, the darkness is gone. You see, light dispels dark. And that's what God is. God is light. And in him is no darkness. None. No darkness. So, wouldn't it stand to reason, if you're going to start to fellowship with him, it's going to start to have an effect on the darkness that you are, or what's been inside of you. And that's what this message is going to start talking about in chapter 2, 3, 4. You'll start to see that John is revealing The fact that when we come into fellowship with the light, the darkness that's in us disappears. All right. So, verse 5, Jesus taught them that God is light. And the other note is, there is no darkness in him at all. Right now, we might go, what's the relevance of that? You know, we'll have to get to that later. You know, what does it matter that there's no darkness in God at all? Just remember that there is no darkness in God. And if you're going to hang around him, any darkness that's in you is going to disappear. And the test is, if there's still darkness in us, we must not be hanging around the light very much. Do you see the simple picture? All right. 
verse 6, if we may say we have fellowship with him and in the darkness may walk, we lie and do not the truth. Now, what the heck is John talking about here? He's saying just what we were just saying, is that if we say we fellowship with the light and yet we're walking in darkness, you know, doing dark acts, living in a dark way, we're, we're lying. We're not fellowshipping with the light. Well, wow, that's kind of insulting. Why, why is he insulting us? No, you're not hearing the coolness of this. What he's saying is that if you fellowship with him, the darkness disappears, like flipping on the light in the room. And so if I've got darkness in me, that means I'm not fellowshipping with him, at least in that area of my life. Absolutely, that's exactly what that means. And that means that I could fellowship with him in that way, and that darkness would flee from me. Absolutely. That's the message of 1 John. You want to get free? Hang around the Lord. All you got to do is get yourself in the presence of the light, and the darkness will leave. It can't stay. Yeah, but I'm having trouble with these demons stuff. Demons? Demons? The darkness? Flip on the switch, man. They're gone. They just fly out the room. That's how much power they have. Does darkness have any power over light at all? When you flip on that switch, the darkness, it's gone instantly. There is no power that a demon has over the light. You see what they acted like around Jesus, the testimony? I mean, they screamed and yelled and feared and shook and, don't cast us out, don't cast us out. You know, uh, don't, don't cast us out before our time. You know, we know who you are. And, and all he said was, go. And I mean, they were gone. That was the end of that. His authority over them was absolute. And that's still his authority over them today. So if you're fearful that, yeah, I've been bothered by demons and stuff, what's the answer? What do I have to do? Do I need to, like, do I need to, like, use some self-help books or do I need to learn something about myself or maybe it has to do with my background. Maybe it's my parents. It's got to be my parents is the problem. That stuff is all irrelevant. It, it doesn't matter what your problem has been in the past. The power of the light is absolute over darkness. There is no darkness that can stand up against the light. Flippy the pagey. Verse 7. And if in the light we may walk, and that would be what we'd want to do as believers, we now start walking. And remember any time you hear the word walk, that's a very specific word. That's not like coming to Jesus at a moment in time. Walking implies in the Hebrew mind that I'm living this thing out day after day after day, all day long, every day. Walking, that's the word walk. And if in the light we may walk, as or since he's in the light, we have fellowship with one another. Now, do you see how that works? In other words, since he's in the light, if in the light I'm walking, then we'll have fellowship with one another. Oh, I have great fellowship with the Lord. But if you're walking in darkness, you don't. Well, you're insulting me again. Not at all. The scripture's not insulting us at all. It's just stating a simple fact. If you're walking in the darkness, you haven't been around the light enough. That's the solution. That's the medicine. You're going to go to the pharmacy and pick up some Jesus. Take some more Jesus. you got to drink some Jesus. See what I mean? Get a few Jesus injections going here, walking in the light, and the darkness will leave. His medicine is absolute. We have fellowship with one another if we walk in the light as he's in the light. And another byproduct of that is the blood of Jesus Christ doth cleanse us from every sin. Yeah, yeah, that's so nice. He forgives me. That's not talking about forgiveness. That's talking about, in my opinion, at this moment at least, that's better than forgiveness. This gets down to reality. I'm sinning. I'm stuck in my habits and my ways. And if you start walking in the light as he's in the light, the sinning starts to stop. Do you see what I mean? Because sin is not what we are made for. It's corruption. It's not right. It's destroying us. A couple of the notes that I wrote down here. To have fellowship with him, we walk or live daily in the light. 
if we walk in the light, if we walk in the light, then we're cleansed from walking in every sin. And let me say this, to the measure that we walk in the light is the measure that we will be cleansed from sinning. Eh, I don't know that sin is any big deal. It says that the wages of sin is death. Well, what's that mean? It means that if you are sinning in your actions, you know, if God says this is what truth is, but you're doing this instead, if you're doing that, it erodes your life, it corrupts your life, it leaves you with a sense of guilt and despair, despondency, frustration, a uh, lack of peace, joy is out the window. It's because of the sin. The sin does that to us. All of us know what we're talking about. We've all experienced it. When you get rid of the sin, that's when you start to notice, oh my gosh, I feel free. I feel happy. I feel light. You know, I feel like running around like a kid. That's because the sin's gone. And that's what he's talking about. Live in the light as I'm in the light and the darkness will flee from you. His light's very powerful and it's very aggressive against sin. So just know this. As you're starting to come around him, immediately the light starts doing its work. What I'm saying to you this afternoon is already doing its work. Some of you might be sitting there going like, I don't like hearing what you're saying. <laughs> See what I'm saying? That, that's okay. If you'd be feeling that, that's just because the light's doing its work. It's coming up against the darkness. It's on the inside. I hate that. No, actually, you'll, you'll start to love it. Because what it does is it starts to, you know, shake up the junk. It's like going into this, this pond that looks kind of clear, right? I'm sure Rob's been around ponds that look kind of clear. You might go fishing in it. But if you go in there and start stirring up the muck that's on the bottom, you start seeing what's really in there. And it all of a sudden gets murky and dark. Well, it wasn't clear at all. It had a bunch of junk that really needs to be, you know, removed. Well, that's our, that's our soul. We, we need to get rid of that junk and only the light can get rid of that. All right. Verse 8. If we may say, we have not sin. I have no sin. I don't sin. Now, that's an antiquated idea anyway. Sin. Sin. What a religious term. If we say, we have not sin, ourselves we lead astray. In other words, we're deceiving ourselves. 